Chapter 4 The Departure of Turin To Brethil, three men only, found their way back at last through Tarnufuin, an evil road. And when Gloritel, Hadal's daughter, learned of the fall of Haldir, she grieved and died. To Dorlomin no tidings came. Rian, wife of Huor, fled into the wild, distraught. But she was aided by the grey elves of Mithrim. And when her child, Tuor, was born, they fostered him. But Rian went to the house in Nirnaeth and laid herself down there and died. Morwen Elithwen remained in Hithlum, silent in grief. Her son, Turin, was only in his ninth year, and she was again with child. Her days were evil. The Easterlings came into the land in great numbers, and they dealt cruelly with the people of Hador, and robbed them of all that they possessed, and enslaved them. All the people of Hudin's homelands that could work or serve any purpose, they took away, even young girls and boys and the old they killed or drove out to starve. But they dared not yet lay hands on the lady of Dorlomin, or thrust her from her house, for the word ran among them that she was perilous, and a witch who had dealings with the white fiends, for so they named the elves, hating them, but fearing them more. For this reason they also feared and avoided the mountains, in which many of the Eldar had taken refuge, especially in the south of the land. And after plundering and harrying, the Easterlings drew back northwards. For Hurin's house stood in the southeast of Dorlomin, and the mountains were near. Nen Lalaith, indeed, came down from a spring under the shadow of Amon Darthir over whose shoulder there was a steep pass. By this the hardy could cross Ered Wethrin, and come down by the wells of Glithui into Beleriand. But this was not known to the Easterlings, nor to Morgoth yet. For all that country, while the house of Fingolfin stood, was secure from him, and none of his servants had ever come there. He trusted that Ered Wethrin was a wall insurmountable both against escape from the north and against assault from the south, and there was indeed no other pass for the unwinged between Serech and far westward, where Dordlomin marched with Nevrast. Thus it came to pass that after the first inroads Morwen was let be, though there were men that lurked in the woods about, and it was perilous to stir far abroad. There still remained, under Morwen's shelter, Sador the Woodwright, and a few old men and women, and Turin, whom she kept close within the garth. But the homestead of Hurin soon fell into decay, and though Morwen laboured hard, she was poor, and would have gone hungry but for the help that was sent to her secretly by Irin, Hurin's kinswoman. For a certain brother, one of the Easterlings, had taken her by force to be his wife. Arms were bitter to Morwen, but she took this aid for the sake of Turin and her unborn child, and because, as she said, it came of her own. For it was this brother who had seized the people, the goods, and the cattle of Hurin's homelands, and carried them off to his own dwellings. He was a bold man, but of small account among his own people, before they came to Hithlum. And so, seeking wealth, he was ready to hold lands that others of his sort did not covet. Morwen he had seen once, when he rode to our house on a foray, but a great dread of her had seized him. He thought that he had looked in the fell eyes of a white fiend and he was filled with a mortal fear lest some evil should overtake him. And he did not ransack her house, nor discover Turin, else the life of the heir of the true lord would have been short. Brother made thralls of the straw heads, as he named the people of Hador, 
and set them to build him a wooden hall in the land to the northward of Hurin's house. And within a stockade his slaves were herded like cattle in a byre, but ill-guarded. Among them some could still be found uncowed and ready to help the lady of Dorlomin, even at their peril, and from them came secretly tidings of the land to Morwen, though there was little hope in the news they brought. But Broda took Eirin as a wife and not a slave, for there were few women amongst his own following, and none to compare with the daughters of the Edine. And he hoped to make himself a lordship in that country, and have an heir to hold it after him. Of what had happened, and of what might happen in the days to come, Morwin said little to Turin, and he feared to break her silence with questions. When the Easterlings first came into Dorlomin, he said to his mother, When will my father come back to cast out these ugly thieves? Why does he not come? Morwen answered, I do not know. It may be that he was slain, or that he is held captive, or again it may be that he was driven far away and cannot yet return through the foes that surround us. Then I think that he is dead, said Turin and before his mother he restrained his tears, for no one could keep him from coming back to help us if he were alive. I do not think that either of those things are true, my son, said Morwen. As the time lengthened, the heart of Morwen grew darker for her son Turin, heir of Dorlomin and Ladros, for she could see no hope for him better than to become a slave of the Easterling men before he was much older. Therefore she remembered her words with Hurin, and her thought turned again to Doriath, and she resolved at last to send Turin away in secret if she could, and to beg King Thingol to harbour him. And as she sat and pondered how this might be done, she heard clearly in her thought the voice of Hurin saying to her, Go swiftly, do not wait for me. But the birth of her child was drawing near, and the road would be hard and perilous. The more that went, the less hope of escape, and her heart still cheated her with hope unadmitted. Her inmost thought foreboded that Hurin was not dead, and she listened for his footfall in the sleepless watches of the night, or would wake, thinking that she had heard in the courtyard the neigh of Aroch, his horse. Moreover, though she was willing that her son should be fostered in the halls of another after the manner of that time, she would not yet humble her pride to be an arms guest, not even of a king. Therefore the voice of Hurin, or the memory of his voice, was denied, and the first strand of the fate of Turin was woven. Autumn of the year of lamentation was drawing on, before Morwen came to this resolve, and then she was in haste, for the time of journeying was short but she dreaded that Turin would be taken if she waited over winter. Easterlings were prowling round the garth and spying on the house. Therefore she said suddenly to Turin, Your father does not come, so you must go, and soon. It is as he would wish. Go? cried Turin. Whither shall we go? Over the mountains? Yes, said Morwen. Over the mountains, away south, south, that way some hope may lie. But I did not say we, my son. You must go, but I must stay. I cannot go alone, said Turin. I will not leave you. Why should we not go together? I cannot go, said Morwen. But you will not go alone. I shall send Gethron with you. And Grithnir, too, perhaps. Will you not send Labadal? said Turin. No, for Sato is lame, said Morwen, and it will be a hard road. And since you are my son, and the days are grim, I will not speak softly. You may die on that road. The year is getting late, but if you stay, you will come to a worse end to be a thrall, 
If you wish to be a man, when you come to a man's age, you will do as I bid, bravely. But I shall leave you only with Sador and blind Ragnir and the old women, said Turin. Did not my father say that I am the heir of Hador? The heir should stay in Hador's house to defend it. How oh, I wish that I still had my knife. The heir should stay, but he cannot, said Morwen. But he may return one day. Now take heart. I will follow you if things grow worse. If I can. But how will you find me, lost in the wild? said Turin. And suddenly his heart failed him, and he wept openly. If you wail, other things will find you first, said Morwen. But I know whither you are going, and if you come there, and if you remain there, there I will find you, if I can. For I am sending you to King Thingol in Doriath. Would you not rather be a king's guest than a thrall? I do not know, said Turin. I do not know what a thrall is. I am sending you away, so that you need not learn it, Morwen answered. Then she set Turin before her and looked into his eyes, as if she were trying to read some riddle there. It is hard, Turin, my son, she said at length. Not hard for you only. It is... Heavy on me in evil days to judge what is best to do. But I do as I think right. For why else should I part with the thing most dear that is left to me? They spoke no more of this together, and Turin was grieved and bewildered. In the morning he went to find Sador, who had been hewing sticks for firing, of which they had little, but they dared not stray out in the woods. And now... He leant on his crutch and looked at the great chair of Hurin, which had been thrust unfinished in a corner. It must go, he said, for only bare needs can be served in these days. Do not break it yet, said Turin. Maybe he will come home, and then it will please him to see what you have done for him while he was away. False hopes are more dangerous than fears, said Sado and they will not keep us warm this winter. He fingered the carving on the chair and sighed. <sighs> I wasted my time, he said, though the hours seemed pleasant. But all such things are short-lived, and the joy in the making is their only true end, I guess. And now I might as well give you back your gift. Turin put out his hand and quickly withdrew it. A man does not take back his gifts, he said. But if it is my own, may I not give it as I will, said Sado. Yes, said Turin, to any man but me. But why should you wish to give it? I have no hope of using it for worthy tasks, Sado said. There will be no work for Labadal in days to come, but thrall work. What is a thrall? said Turin. A man who was a man, but is treated as a beast, Sador answered, fed only to keep alive, kept alive only to toil, toiling only for fear of pain or death, and from these robbers he may get pain or death just for their sport. I hear that they pick some of the fleet-footed and hunt them with hounds. They have learned quicker from the orcs than we learnt from the fair folk. Now I understand things better, said Turin. It is a shame that you should have to understand such things so soon, said Sador. Then seeing the strange look on Turin's face, what do you understand now? Why, my mother is sending me away, said Turin and tears filled his eyes. Ah, said Sador, and he muttered to himself, but why so long delayed? Then turning to Turin, he said, that does not seem news for tears to me, but you should not speak your mother's counsels aloud to Labadal or to anyone. All walls and fences have ears these days, 
ears that do not grow on fair heads. But I must speak with someone, said Turin. I've always told things to you. I do not want to leave you, Labadal. I do not want to leave this house or my mother. But if you do not, said Sador, soon there will be an end of the house of Hador forever, as you must understand now. Labadal does not want you to go, but Sador, servant of Hurin, will be happier when Hurin's son is out of the reach of the Easterlings. Well, well, it cannot be helped. We must say farewell. Now will you not take my knife as a parting gift? No, said Turin. I am going to the elves, to the king of Doriath, my mother says. There I may get other things like it. But I shall not be able to send you any gifts, Labadal. I shall be far away and all alone. Then Turin wept. But Sador said to him, Hey, now, where is Hurin's son? For I heard him say not long ago, I shall go as a soldier with an elf king as soon as I am able. Then Turin stayed his tears, and he said, Very well, if those were the words of the son of Hurin, he must keep them and go. But whenever I say that I will do this or that, it looks very different when the time comes. Now I am unwilling. I must take care not to say such things again. It would be best indeed, said Sador. So most men teach, and few men learn. Let the unseen days be. Today is more than enough. Now Turin was made ready for the journey, and he bade farewell to his mother, and departed in secret with his two companions. But when they bade Turin turn and look back upon the house of his father, then the anguish of parting smote him like a sword, and he cried, Morwen, Morwen, when shall I see you again? But Morwen, standing on her threshold, heard the echo of that cry in the wooded hills, and she clutched the post of the door so that her fingers were torn. This was the first of the sorrows of Turin. Early in the year after Turin was gone, Morwen gave birth to her child, and she named her Nienor, which is mourning. But Turin was already far away when she was born. Long and evil was his road, for the power of Morgoth was ranging far abroad. But he had as guides Gethron and Grithnir, who had been young in the days of Hador, and though they were now aged, they were valiant, and they knew well the lands, for they had journeyed often through Beleriand in former times. Thus, by fate and courage, they passed over the shadowy mountains, and coming down into the Vale of Sirion, they passed into the forest of Brethil, and at last, weary and haggard, they reached the confines of Doriath. But there, they became bewildered, and were enmeshed in the mazes of the queen, and wandered lost amid the pathless trees until all their food was spent. There they came near to death, for winter came cold from the north. But not so light was Turin's doom. Even as they lay in despair, they heard a horn sounded. Beleg the Strongbow was hunting in that region for he dwelt ever on the marches of Doriath, and he was the greatest woodsman of those days. He heard their cries and came to them, and when he had given them food and drink, he learned their names and whence they came, and he was filled with wonder and pity. And he looked with liking upon Turin, for he had the beauty of his mother and the eyes of his father, and he was sturdy and strong. What boon would you have of King Thingol? said Beleg to the boy. I would be one of his knights, to ride against Morgoth and avenge my father, said Turin. That may well be when the years have increased you, said Beleg, for though you are yet small, you have the makings of a valiant man, worthy to be a son of Hurin the Steadfast, if that were possible. 
for the name of Hurin was held in honor in all the lands of the elves. Therefore Beleg gladly became the guide of the wanderers, and he led them to a lodge where he dwelt at that time with other hunters, and there they were housed while a messenger went to Menegroth. And when word came back that Thingol and Melian would receive the son of Hurin and his guardians, Beleg led them by secret ways into the hidden kingdom. Thus Turin came to the great bridge over the Escalduin and passed the gates of Thingol's halls. And as a child he gazed upon the marvels of Menegroth, which no mortal man before had seen, save Beren only. Then Gethron spoke the message of Morwen before Thingol and Melian, and Thingol received them kindly, and set Turin upon his knee, in honor of Hurin, mightiest of men, and of Beren his kinsman. And those that saw this marvel, for it was a sign that Thingol took Turin as his foster son, and that was not at that time done by kings, nor ever again by elf lord to a man. Then Thingol said to him, Here, son of Hurin, shall your home be, and in all your life you shall be held as my son, man though you be. Wisdom shall be given you beyond the measure of mortal men, and the weapons of the elves shall be set in your hands. Perhaps the time may come when you shall regain the lands of your father in Hithlum, but dwell now here in love. Thus began the sojourn of Turin in Doriath. With him remained for a while Gethron and Grithnir, his guardians, though they yearned to return again to their lady in Dorlomin. Then age and sickness came upon Grithnir, and he stayed beside Turin until he died. But Gethron departed, and Thingol sent with him an escort to guide him and guard him. And they brought words from Thingol to Morwen. They came at last to Hurin's house, and when Morwen learned that Turin was received with honor in the halls of Thingol, a grief was lightened. And the elves brought also rich gifts from Melian, and a message bidding her return with Thingol's folk to Doriath. For Melian was wise and foresighted, and she hoped thus to avert the evil that was prepared in the thought of Morgoth. But Morwen would not depart from her house, for her heart was yet unchanged, and her pride still high. Moreover, Nianor was a babe in arms. Therefore she dismissed the elves of Doriath with her thanks, and gave them in gift the last small things of gold that remained to her, concealing her poverty, and she bade them take back to Thingol the helm of Hador. But Turin watched ever for the return of Thingol's messengers, and when they came back alone he fled into the woods and wept. For he knew of Melian's bidding, and he had hoped that Morwen would come. This was the second sorrow of Turin. When the messengers spoke Morwen's answer, Melian was moved with pity, perceiving her mind, and she saw that the fate which she foreboded could not lightly be set aside. The helm of Hador was given into Thingol's hands. That helm was made of grey steel, adorned with gold, and on it were graven runes of victory. A power was in it that guarded any who wore it from wound or death, for the sword that hewed it was broken, and the dart that smote it sprang aside. It was wrought by Telkar, the smith of Nogrod, whose works were renowned. It had a visor after the manner of those that the dwarves used in their forges for the shielding of their eyes, and the face of one that wore it struck fear into the hearts of all beholders, but was itself guarded from dart and fire. Upon its crest was set in defiance a gilded image of Klaurung the dragon, for it had been made soon after he first issued from the gates of Morgoth. Often Hador and Galdor after him had borne it in war, 
and the hearts of the host of Hithlum were uplifted when they saw it towering high amid the battle, and they cried, Of more worth is the dragon of Dorlomin than the gold worm of Angband. But Hurin did not wear the dragon helm with ease, and in any case he would not use it, for he said, I would rather look on my foes with my true face. Nonetheless, he accounted the helm among the greatest heirlooms of his house. Now Thingol had in Menegroth deep armories, filled with great wealth of weapons, metal, wrought like fish's mail and shining like water in the moon, swords and axes, shields and helms, wrought by Telkar himself, or by his master, Camil Zirak the Old, or by elven rites more skilful still. For some things he had received in gift that came out of Valinor, and were wrought by Feanor in his mastery, than whom no craftsman was greater in all the days of the world. Yet Thingol handled the helm of Hador as though his hoard were scanty, and he spoke courteous words, saying, Proud were the head that bore this helm, which the sires of Hurin bore. Then a thought came to him, and he summoned Turin, and told him that Morwen had sent to her son a mighty thing, the heirloom of his father's. Take now the dragon head of the north, he said, and when the time comes, wear it well. But Turin was yet too young to lift the helm, and he heeded it not because of the sorrow of his heart.